I was debating whether or not to make rage bait, but I mean the Celtics, we know they have this finals lockdown. And to everyone who's hated on the Celtics saying that they couldn't get it done in the postseason, where are you right now? Because everyone switched up so fast because everyone was so high on the Mavericks saying Mavericks in six, Mavericks in five, and no one really believed that, did you? Because the Mavericks are led by two players, and there's nothing wrong with being led by two players, right? We've seen teams with two players win the finals in the past. Teams like the Miami Heat with Dwayne Wade and Shaquille O'Neal, and other teams have done it before too. But the difference now between that, even last year with the Nuggets, Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic, is that they're going against the Celtics, who is their super team, if we're being honest. Their least offensive player on is who drew holiday and he's led all the celtics with 26 points in game two he gets so little attention from the mavericks and the mavericks what, what are they doing on defense because i get that you have to guard Chad and tatum but every time tatum drives he draws a double team and there's an era of help defense when you're going against superstars you have to double these players right because they're going to make you pay one-on-one -on -one, right and Jason Tatum still had double digits assists, even with the help defense, you know, always coming to him because of that. And players like Drew Holiday were able to score 26 because Drew Holiday is a good player. He's had seasons where he averaged 21 points, I believe, back when he was on the Pelicans. And even on the Bucks, he was a big piece to that team, obviously being the second best, third best player maybe, because Chris Middleton was the second best at the time. But still, you can't, undervalued Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday is still in his prime and he's not going to get the recognition he deserves just like any other player on the Celtics because their stats aren't going to match up with it. But that's what happens when you have such a loaded team. Your stats aren't going to look as good as if you were a player on a bad team like the Hornets because if you put Brandon Miller on the Celtics he's not going to average 20 points for example, right? You understand that. So just because they're on the Celtics and there's just so many great players, everyone's going to average a little bit less amount of points, a little bit less rebounds, a little bit less assists. Okay, not less assists, maybe. But you get what I'm trying to say because they're sharing the ball with so many players and you have so many good offensive players. Al Horford is hitting threes. Kristaps Porzingis, <laughs> he's too tall. The Mavericks are so short. Derek Lively is 7-1 and he's the only one who would really give Kristaps know something uh, to, he'll only be he will be the only player who made it hard for him because Luca did in game one but game two Kristaps Porzingis was like okay whatever and the thing about the Mavericks is that they switch every single time they keep switching and Kristaps Porzingis keeps getting these favorable matchups with guys like Jaden Hardy or guys like Luka Doncic guys like Josh Green and players who should never be guarding Kristaps Porzingis one-on-one -on -one, Kristaps can just face them up and oftentimes he's just gonna shoot over them and he's actually good at doing that. We say other players can do that like Kevin Durant or Women Yama, these tall players, but Kristaps Porzingis is among the best at shooting over players who are shorter than him. He just is in drawing fouls especially because Derek Jones Jr. could not guard Kristaps without fouling. That's just he's just not good enough defensively. He's six six, Kristaps is seven three, that's a nine inch difference. That's not gonna be easy to guard someone that much taller than you. And the Mavericks don't have an answer for Kristaps Porzingis except putting Derek Lively on him, which was actually working in game two. Derek Lively was the answer. Now the problem there is Derek Lively only played 14 minutes in game one before you know, having to set out on the bench to pretty much the rest of the game because he had five fouls. And if he can stay out of foul trouble, then good for the Mavericks because at least Kristaps Porzingis can be neutralized. But even then, when you're neutralizing Kristaps Porzingis and dividing him, you still have to answer to Jason Tatum, to Jalen Brown, Derek White, you know everyone else. And their bench is going to get even better, I'm expecting, because Peyton Pritchard has played terrible these last two games. He's only made like one shot, so he's due for at least some a somewhat good game. And then you have Derek White, who hasn't been shooting all that well either. He's going to be due for a good game anytime now. And Jalen Brown, he's been phenomenal. He's so good defensively. He's so athletic. Uh, people don't give Jalen Brown credit. They don't believe that he should have been on Team USA. And he got snubbed. And they're wondering why is he the highest paid player? Because he's just that good. He can guard. He's getting blocks. He has a high vertical jump. 
it's ridiculous how high he can jump. And then on offense, he's just so strong that anyone who tries to guard him, they can get pushed back. Meanwhile, on defense, you have people like Kyrie, who usually pushes other guys when he's on offense. Kyrie likes to put his shoulder in. He can't do that with Jalen Brown. You saw that one possession where Jalen Brown was guarding him, and Jalen Brown had his feet down on the ground, and then he just stood his ground. As simple as that. And Kyrie Irving right there wasn't able to score on Jalen Brown. In fact, he got a turnover because of it. He got the traveling call against him. And Jalen Brown is such, he's been such a good defender. So has Jason Tatum. Because the Celtics, when they do pack the paint, you know, Jason Tatum, because he's tall, he can get those blocks from behind. So similar to Derek White even, who got a couple of blocks this series already. Because the Celtics are, they're, just that much better they're more athletic than other teams that have better size than the Mavericks and that's been one of the problems with the Mavericks that's why they did get Daniel Gafford from free agents or from not free agency but the trade deadline that's why they would you know try to get these players move Greg Williams get him out of here and then make the get Daniel Gafford who is one of the better players on the Wizards who I think is an overrated defender actually because there's a reason why the Mavericks take Daniel Gafford out of the game so early to put Derek Lively in. And that's because Derek Lively is a much better defender, we know that. But also to answer to Chris Alps Porzingis every time he would come in. That's why Daniel Gafford, he would more so match the minutes of Al Horford than he would Chris Alps Porzingis because that's a better matchup for Daniel Gafford, who is not that good at getting blocks. He got posterized by Jalen Brown already this series. And that's been the thing of his career. You know, He's not afraid to go up. He's not afraid to contest shots at the rim. But the, he's not very good at it either he doesn't get that many blocks ever he doesn't get that many stops he doesn't force a lot of misses either and Daniel Gafford is a problem he's got to be better because if you're comparing this team to the 2011 Mavericks then the Tyson Chandler of this team is Derek Lively it's not Daniel Gafford but the problem is Derek Lively is coming off the bench while Daniel Gafford's not so Daniel Gafford while he is a starting center while he's been the starting center for months in their best lineups or whatever if you look at the stats it's not that well and that's there's a reason why Derek Lively why we always talk about his plus minus and not Daniel Gafford's because Derek Lively is he has he's more of a positive impact player than Daniel Gafford and, and that's just facts you don't have to argue about that you know that Derek Lively's you know been better for the Mavericks in mean, his minutes or are better than Daniel Gafford's minutes and then another thing about the Mavericks is that you, they shouldn't be struggling with size. You know, they should be able to guard the Celtics pretty well because they have Derrick Jones, who was who I thought he was a power forward because he looks a lot bigger than 6'6", watching him play. And he's been playing small for for the Mavericks, actually. But he never guards Tatum. They have other players guard Tatum. And even when Tatum is off ball, you still have to guard him because everyone on the Celtics is also a really great passer. Jalen Brown is a good passer. He just can't pass to the left, right? Because he can't drive to the left. He can't finish with his left. He can't pass to the left. But Derek White's a good passer. Drew Holiday is a terrific playmaker. We don't really talk about his playmaking a lot. But he is. And the Chris Ops we're is he likes to take those isos. He likes to take those one-on-ones. He doesn't really pass much unless it's like a set play. But you get what I'm saying. That the Celtics have great playmaking. And because of that, you can't afford to leave Tatum open. You can't afford to leave any of these players on an island. So the, what the Mavericks have been doing is that they pack the paint. They usually have about three players in the paint every time someone tries to go drive. And, but is that really helping? Because everyone on the Celtics is also a good three-point shooter. So while you can pack the paint, while you can have this help defense always go to the paint and have multiple defenders there for any time that someone on the Celtics tries to drive, you're just going to be leaving someone open. So the answer to that if you're gonna give up those threes, which weren't even falling, but the Celtics, you know, they were still winning. So even if you're giving up those threes, then you have to be prepared to make threes of your own. And with Luka Doncic unable to get to make those plays that he's usually capable of, because the attention has been drawn towards his playmaking ability and not as much as his scoring ability as the way they guard Kyrie. Because when they guard Kyrie, they're more focused on just guarding him, double teaming him. And forcing him this way, forcing him that way, while Luka Doncic is preventing him from passing because that's what killed the Timberwolves. That's the only reason the Mavericks were able to move on past the Timberwolves is that Luka Doncic was past the PJ Washington, past the Derrick Jones, and these players will make their three-point shots. You're not seeing that anymore against the Celtics, 
and the Celtics know how to guard that. It's similar to how Jokic was being guarded last year's playoffs where they were guarding his playmaking ability instead and that's what the Suns did and that's what the Celtics are doing to Luka and it's working. So, what? but the Mavericks, it, can you count them out yet? No, you can't count the Mavericks out yet simply because not just, it's, it's not really simple because it's more than just Luka Doncic but it's the NBA Finals. Everyone's going to elevate. You're going to see players start to hit their threes. You're going to see Kyrie go crazy because they're playing at home and Kyrie Irving is always better at home. That's the bottom line. Thank you for watching. See you next week.